will stay true to your mission and um, just learning how we can take these next steps together in, in the classically unprecedented times. So uh, Emily, just kick it over to the next slide. Uh, what we should do, as is our tradition, of course, is go around and just introduce yourself, if you don't mind, and say your name and the organization you're with, so that people who are unfamiliar with you can make note of that and be sure to catch up with you after the meeting. So I'm XAM Black, and I'm the Executive Director of Tulsa Regional STEM Alliance. I'll go next. I'm Emily Mortimer. I'm the Program Director. and. One way to kind of keep people from talking over each other and to alleviate dead space is if you look at um, the list of names, if you just tag someone that you see below your name, then um, we won't try to over compete with each other. So I'm going to tag Lynn. Hi there, uh, I'm Lynn Stagg. So I am the office manager and oversee just all the logistics for the advisory council. So welcome everyone. And I don't have anyone below me, but I will go to Josh, since I know he's up next as a speaker. Hello, everyone. I'm Josh Walton. I am the Data Analyst and HR Manager with Tulsa Regional STEM Alliance, and I will tag Jamie. Hi, everyone. Uh, Jamie Christensen. I'm our Events Manager at TRSA. I'm going to tag Dr. Price. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm Doug Price, Director of Global Learning at Tulsa Community College. Good morning, and welcome to my home. I wanted to have you all over for a long time. Here we go. So, and uh, I can tag, how about Melanie Calm? She's right below me. Hi, I'm Melanie Cam, and I'm with uh, Starbase Oklahoma. Good morning. And I'll tag Barbara. Barbara, I think you're muted. How about if I go? <laughs> Is that okay? I'm Jackie Kennedy. I'm uh, the director of the Osage County Interlocal and I'll be presenting today. So I'll talk a little bit more about my organization in a few minutes. And I'll tag Kristen. Good morning. I'm um, Kristen Tanner. I'm a pre K 20 program manager for the Tulsa Regional STEM Alliance. And I will tag um, Aaliyah. Hi, I'm Aaliyah DeVore. I'm the Communications Coordinator for the Tulsa Regional STEM Alliance. So I'm going to tag Suzanne. Good morning. I'm Sue Ann Weimer. I'm with Tulsa City County Library and I manage youth services for our library system. I will tag um, Courtney. Hi, I'm Courtney Selking. I am with Discovery Lab and their Director of Education. And I'll take Brian. Uh, thank you, Courtney. Uh, I'm Brian Bovard with the uh, Outdoor Classroom Program at uh, Woodward Park. And I also work with my uh, compatriots over at the Linnaeus Teaching Garden at Woodward Park. And I will, have I heard from, oh, I have to move my uh, names up here. We covered nearly everyone. Wilson. Carrie? Sure. Hi, I'm Carrie Engelbrecht. I'm with Engineering at Cox Communications. And um, I'll tag Jason. Hey, I'm Jason Jadamski, and I'm the director for um, Broken, Arrow, Broken Arrow Public Schools Innovation Academy that opens in another year. Um, I'll tag, I don't know if Heather went yet. Hi, I apologize. I'm Heather McDowell. I'm the associate director uh, for OCAS, which is the Oklahoma Center for the Advancement of Science and Technology. 
and my video camera is not working. So I do apologize. And I had to step away for an early morning chat with a four year old. So I don't know who has gone and who has not gone. Has Mandy gone? I have not gone. I'm Mandy Lemus and I am President of Tulsa Flight Night and uh, Director of Corporate Responsibility at Nordium. Rita, you want to go next? I think we haven't heard from Isabella. She's still on. Uh, Charla Martin. Or Rita Miller. Hi. <laughs> I unmuted myself, so I, I, you guys would written, I have to read my list. Um, I'm Rita Miller, director of Starbase Oklahoma, and happy to be here. Happy to see all of you. I think that's everybody that's on, Emily. Emily, you want to turn it over to Josh and mute yourself? All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Emily, you can go to the next slide, actually. I'll go over my little overview here. So today I'll be speaking about data collection in this virtual world. As with everything else, there are unique challenges TRSA faces in collecting meaningful data, but there are factors you may be navigating as well. So first, we will jump into TRSA-specific programs data to see if there are any quirks compared to the previous years. And of course, spoiler alert, there are some quirks. Next, I will discuss the primary issues facing us in data collection and how we are combating these. And finally, I will discuss our programs in the immediate future and the impact we have made so far, including partner support. So let's jump into an overview for our program data here for the past few years. As expected, 2020 is not in line with 2019 in terms of number of programs conducted. Essentially, we are placed in the same capacity as we had in 2018, which can be concerning for a multitude of reasons. However, like all organizations at this time, we have, we have had to adapt quickly to the circumstances. Programming did not simply stop, it was only innovated. With the hard work, hard work of our team, we were able to keep most of our major programs afloat during this period. And the only major lacking area is really our outreach efforts. So of course, we're not going out doing a lot of family STEM nights right now, and a lot of our educational partners are shut down indefinitely. So um, a lot of those instances of programming uh, are, uh, why you're seeing this gap. And on the next slide, we have our student numbers. So although our programs uh, quickly plateaued after March, and Emily can go next slide for that one. Oh, back, back, back one more. So would have easily, I mean, just a second, know, we're freezing here. Okay. There we go. Okay. There we go. Thank you. So this is our student numbers um, with our program data. Although our programs quickly plateaued after March, our student numbers have only grown. So in our development, we found the capacity to reach more students through the distancing measures, meaning TRSA and many of our partners have helped fund and build thousands and thousands of STEM educational take-home kits. And I'll speak more to these numbers later. So nevertheless, our student programming metrics are in good shape, at least in terms of our previous measures. Well, straight numbers don't tell the, are great and all, but again, doesn't tell the whole picture. So on the next slide, talk about some of the issues we're facing right now. Of course, uh, as I mentioned, does not capture the whole picture, just looking at our sheer numbers. We are experiencing various issues in data collection, especially in their meaningful impact. First, we're finding that those receiving our take-home kits are not being as responsive as usual towards our programming surveys. I include this picture underneath the minimal participation because A, it demonstrates how I feel trying to capture the program surveys when participants usually just don't care or they throw it away. 
And also this is uh, usually me uh, during summer camps when we're all together and I'm literally chasing papers and surveys as they blow in the wind. But just a small little nostalgia trip there. Uh, going forward, we will be including incentives for our students to participate in our data collection. Hopefully this will help um, with the participation in our surveys. And for example, our summer camp participation, we are, are incentivizing with t-shirts. So if students complete the pre and post, we will get, give them a t-shirt. Uh, now you're probably thinking, wouldn't that skew the results if you give incentive? Well, of course it will. However, we have to work with what we have. And I would argue that the skew is minim minimal or similar to students taking surveys during events. There are always variables at play that we cannot, cannot account for, but it is our job to interpret the results with an analytical eye. Which brings me to my next point, all data during this time should be evaluated as a special historical event. The circumstances require us to mark this data during the pandemic as a unique event, which will give us the ability to filter out this period if needed. Or we now have the ability to compare the results with previous years and test our initial thoughts. One, one might assume uh, surveys might be skewed negatively during the stressful time, but what if they're same or what if they're better? What does this mean for future programming? It's an interesting question and I'm excited to see more of these results. And the final point on this slide, there's uh, essentially no turning back now. All our programs are forever changed and virtual education uh, was a dire need in the beginning, but that capacity is being quickly filled. So as we slowly reopen, what happens to this virtual capacity? We probably won't just throw it away. It is a lasting impact on our programs, which in turn influences the students we serve. We might discover there is a population of students who responded more to our virtual programming rather than in-person events only adding to the complexities of equity in the education. On the next slide, let's go into some of our upcoming programs. So the Summer Academy is the first thing on the docket coming up with our first virtual camp kicking off next week. And uh, Jamie will be discussing more and more about our Summer Academy later, so I won't go into any details. But luckily, the data collection for these programs will essentially be unchanged. For the third year in a row, we're going to be using Common Instrument from the Fair Institute, we'll, and uh, that will be measuring any changes in STEM engagement interests along with 21st century skills. Additionally, for the second year, we'll be recording HOPE scale data. For those unaware of the HOPE scale, it is a simple six-item survey where you get insight into students' agency and willpower. HOPE has been shown to be highly correlated with academic achievement and general well-being during the classroom years. And for our STEM and bad kits, this data collection is still ongoing. As I mentioned, we're not having the best of luck receiving surveys or feedback. I was really excited for the opportunity to learn more about STEM at home from students, from a student's perspective, but alas, we would need more submissions. The surveys also asked about how the student is managing the pandemic and what resources would be helpful for educational purposes. With more responses, we might be able to gain insights into our community, especially in high need areas. And my final slide here, uh, I wanted to speak, speaking of the STEM in the bag efforts, here's a map of our outreach so far. And this slide is mainly here to brag about our efforts as a community and ecosystem and our TRSA staff. Many of, us, many of us present have sore fingers from making these kits, but the impact has been massive in, just, in talking about in sheer numbers. The spread of distribution has reached high need rural and urban areas with a little over 29,000 kits delivered so far. I'm proud to be a part of this community that came together so quickly to help fill these educational gaps, and I don't see us slowing down anytime soon. Hopefully, we receive more data to get a deeper look into the impact we made during this time. This is all I have for now, but feel free to reach out if you have any more questions or if you would like to support, or if you need support in your own data collection during this difficult time, I will truly enjoy the opportunity. Thank you all. Hello, I'm going to talk a little bit about Discovery Lab today and how we've adjusted. Uh, so first, just uh, the museum obviously is closed. We're still working to figure out um, uh, an opening date for the actual museum. The museum is built around hands-on learning and collaboration. So it is hard for kids, obviously, to social distance with those two things. Um, so at this time, we're not really sure about when the actual museum will open. So we are looking a lot at our education response. Um, and this has included um, a couple of different tiers of things that I'm going to go through and talk about today, starting with our Discover at Home. 
Uh, Discover at Home, we started uploading um, right away different experiments and activities and challenges um, that kids and families could do at home using materials that would be easily accessible. Um, like many organizations, we utilized um, social media platforms uh, to upload all of these things, as well as we added a distant learning page on our website. Um, and this is kind of the where we are holding all of those videos, they also have um, alignment to the Oklahoma standards. Uh, so as I said, on that distant learning page itself, um, it's kind of our centralized place uh, where all of the videos, there's a little overview of the video topics. Um, and then their alignment to the Oklahoma standards. Uh, we work with Tulsa Public Schools um, to broadcast um, STEM experiments uh, where we walked through with kids um, things using materials that they would likely have at home as well. Um, this was five or six weeks long uh, and it has ended. Um, we've also continued to do some outreaches and series. There were uh, current of our different organizations and customers that reached out and wanted to find a way to continue uh, distant learning with us. Um, so that's looked different um, in, depending on what the organization needs have been. And then teacher professional development, um, this as well, we've adjusted to the distant learning model um, through kits and videos and online um, learning. Some of our partnerships uh, that we have been working with for outreach, obviously TSR, TRSA uh, doing their sum in a bag, um, as Josh talked about. Um, our staff have been helping with those supplies and then Xan and our director Ray made some videos to go along with the bags um, so students could watch those as well. Um, Sensational Science, I'm sure someone from TRSA is gonna be updating on that, um, but we've adjusted that as well to go virtual. Um, AHA was another partner and they had some social media content that was um, some art experiments. And so we kind of paired up and looked for alignment in some of our activities and in our videos and via social media tagged each other and talked about the connection between the activities. So if they were doing um, like bubble art. Uh, we talked about the science of bubbles um, and those connections for kids to do. Tulsa Public Schools, like I said, we, we worked on the television part and we are working on some um, summer camps. The, I guess, method that Tulsa Public Schools is using for summer camps is just an online kind of a resource center. Um, so we will be sending them four different camps uh, which are basically just a theme like weather and there's five activities that go along with it. Um, it's kind of the lesson plan or the activity sheet in a family friendly way and the activities again are activity, the materials are materials that you would likely be able to find easily around your house or um, at a grocery store or something like that. Um, Women in Recovery is a partner that we do outreach with regularly and so um, we are continuing to work with them. We have delivered kits and then done Zoom uh, outreach calls with their group um, of caregiver and children. And then the Opportunity Project, we had already planned to do a lot of summer learning and um, we did over uh, 1,200 STEM kits for their students. And next week we will start doing small Zoom calls daily with groups of kids to walk them through five different STEM activities. Um, Urban Strategies and the Tulsa Housing Authority is another partner that are continuing to use this kind of outreach uh, kit, Zoom printed instruction model um, for additional opportunities this summer. And then our teacher professional development with Sensational Science um, and we have a couple other grants where we were doing uh, STEM professional development or action-based learning professional development we're working on adapting those to be more of this uh, kit and online learning model. For summer camps, we have changed up um, to be all distant learning. So we've kind of tiered some different options for our summer camp. Um, 
where Discover at Home, which will just be, again, free camps. It'll be the activity sheets and a couple of different themes um, where families and kids can walk through and do camps at home with the materials that they would have. Uh, the next, I guess, tier is called Discover at Your Own Pace. And these are going to have four different uh, topics that are providing a kit that has some of the supplies as well as there will be other supplies that you would normally find at home that you would need, but in the supply kits um, are some of the things that would necessarily be things that you would have. And so those different camps are around chemistry, Legos, um, Survivor Island, and flying machines. Um, and so they can purchase the, the kits and the lesson plans and the videos and just walk through them at their own pace throughout the summer. Um, Zoom in on Discovery is another tier that is more tech-based and same themed camps, um, those four chemistry, Legos, flying machines, and Survivor Island, but these uh, will include the kit and then daily Zoom calls will be a morning 30-minute Zoom call and a afternoon 30-minute Zoom call that will walk students through activities. Um, this kit will have 10 activities in it and the Discover at Your Own Pace has five. Um, so the zoom in is a little bit doubled and we'll have some educator walk them through the learning each day. Additionally, we have some tech camps that will be um, using Azobat and coding. Um, through TRSA, we have planned to work with students at McClure this summer um, to use Azobots to teach coding. Um, so we'll be working with our Accessible Discovery program and looking for partners like Women in Recovery or THA um, to do these camps with students virtually. Um, and we'll also have them open to the public. There'll, there'll be two different levels of it. Um, Week-long camps, there'll be an hour Zoom call in the morning and an hour Zoom call in the afternoon. We'll, we'll walk them through also about um, coding and on different platforms and hands-on learning. Um, as well as some different challenges to really learn about their Azobots. Um, all of our camps are recommended for 7 through 12 They're through June and July. We opened registration last Friday, and I've seen those registrations start rolling in. Um, and so we are excited to see how the distant learning um, model works, and I'm sure learn a lot of lessons and hopefully help bridge some of the learning um, that students can do over the summer while schools and teachers are taking a break from more distant uh, learning options. I think that is it for me. Uh, if you have any questions about anything I talked about or anything Discovery Lab, let me know. Um, like everyone else, we're learning a lot during this time and excited to see uh, how we can still move forward. Thank you. Next we have um, Kristen on professional development. Hi, everyone. Um, at our last advisory council meeting, I spoke a lot about all of our upcoming summer PD. Um, so now I'm just going to kind of update you on where that's gone and what the plans are and just give a few lessons learned. Um, you can go to the next slide, then. Kristen, I would suggest turning your video off because you're real laggish and we have found in our Zoom calls if you have slow Wi-Fi, if you'll turn your video off, it'll go, we can hear you a lot better. Like All right, I'll try that. Um, so as I mentioned uh, at our last call, or our last meeting, I updated everyone on all the tons of PD that we were having this summer. Um, so obviously that being um, moved to a virtual format or it may be rescheduled depending on the provider and depending on the type of workshop. So as we were thinking about this, um, we've learned that some of the cons were that we've had a few teachers, especially in rural areas who they don't have stable internet or they don't have any internet out where they live, a few people have had to drop out. Um, but what we did is tell them that they're basically guaranteed a spot when we offer it next summer so that they still are able to participate. Um, but mostly overall, we've heard a lot of teachers that, um, very positive saying, you know, that before they weren't going to be able to participate because they didn't know what they were going to do about child care, especially for a program like sensational science that generally lasts two weeks, that can be an issue. Um, so. Overall, it's been very positive and teachers are really excited that we're still moving forward. Next slide, please. 
So our very first um, thing that we had to transition to kind of on the fly in the spur of the moment was our STEM Ed Camp and Crawl. And this is normally um, held in March and it's our spring follow-up day to sensational science. Um, where teachers share the lesson plans that they've taught and they collaborate on each other with each other and they learn from each other and that happens in the morning and then in the afternoon they would go to a partner and have like a mini sensational science day. So for this instance we had to do away with the crawl part obviously and we um, formatted the morning the ed camp style to be a discussion board. So kind of like a college class Luckily, this was already in place. Teachers already had access to the um, discussion board, and those who were not partisan that were planning to come to the camp from crawl got access to the to discussion board. So they were able to post the lessons and have a virtual discussion um, about the lessons and get ideas from each other. So even with that, we still had 54 teachers participate, which I think is pretty good. Uh, next slide, please. So right now we are gearing up for Sensational Science. I uh, heard Courtney mention that they, they are one of our partners at the Discovery Lab. Um, Brian from um, Outdoor Classroom and Linnaeus, they are also some of our, our partners for this. So we've been working with partners to take everything that we normally would do, which would be a um, kind of a rotation where teachers visit each partner either one or two a day over a two week period. And we've transitioned it where all of the content will be online. Teachers are giving, given a kit of materials so they can still do the activities at home. And then there's opportunities for them to connect via like a live Zoom call. We've got teachers who are starting to pick up kits. Um, in order to make it safe, we schedule them a time slot. They don't come in the building. They call me when they get here and I bring it down and we wear masks and they fill out the paperwork and then they get their materials. So that kicks off Monday morning. We're really excited. And again, overwhelmingly, teachers have been super supportive and thankful that this is still uh, going on. And they, they will have the whole month of June to complete their activities. So there's a little bit more flexibility with that. Um, the next one that we will be hosting will be in July, and that is the Flight Night Drone Institute. And same thing, it will be virtual setting where it will be ha have both synchronous and asynchronous participation. And our partners have been super wonderful about like, yeah, of course we're going to go virtual. No problem. We've already got ideas. So um, they're already teachers. So um, Spartan and um, Tulsa Community College, you know, they're already having to provide their content virtually. So they were like, no problem. So really excited to see how that's going to go. Um, and that is still open for registration. So if you know any teachers that would benefit from that, please feel free to share it out. Um, next slide, please. In the month of July, I call it Dr. Parrot Month because she is providing a series of three weeks worth of PD for different age groups for our exponential uh, growth math PD. Um, and this one has an extensive wait list. Even after teachers were said, hey, we're going virtual. I mean, there's so many people on the wait list. It's amazing. Um, just really shows, I think, the, the quality of the program, the, the, what Dr. Parrot brings to it, and the need for this sort of PD. Um, so, um, Dr. Parrots will be live, so teachers um, will meet in the morning just like they would in the classroom, and then they will have activities and assignments that they'll work on in the afternoon and then bring them back to share. Um, in this PD, we have a fall and a spring follow-up day, and we're still hoping to be able to hold those face-to-face, -face, but um, that will, we'll just have to see how that, how that goes. So this, this PD will serve 16 teachers. Um, next. And we have a lot of computer science professional development scheduled for this summer. Some of them have been rescheduled and some of them are continuing. So the code.org and the project lead the way are continuing as planned, just moving to a virtual format. Um, and right now they're seeing um, code.org is seeing just across the country a little bit less participation than they normally would have with the face-to-face -face workshop. And so we're still hoping to um, get more teachers involved. So if you know any teacher that um, is interested, middle school or high school for code.org, please tell them about this PD. Normally it would cost their district, but it's free for Tulsa area teachers. 
And then the same with Project Lead the Way. Um, this is a, a program where schools that already subscribe to the Gateway curriculum, which is their middle school curriculum, they can come to Project Lead the Way, take the app creator class, and then they're um, qualified to teach it and open it up to their schools. So this is another one where normally they would have to pay at least $1,200 for the class plus travel expenses because it's normally held in like Kansas or Texas. So this is a real savings for districts who would like to expand and add this to their class. So it's still going to be held in July, same time frame as it normally would be, and they will be um, mostly synchronous with some out of um, class assignments that they'll do on their own in asynchronous time. Hey, Kristen, can you share those on social media so we can promote those? Yes, and who's, who's that I'm sorry speaking? Mandy. Yes, absolutely. Um, next slide, please. Um, I think we skipped one. I'm can, oh, there you go. No, go back one more, please. Give me just a second, froze again. So a couple of the programs that we did have scheduled um, will be rescheduled, hopefully for face-to-face -face or virtual. It's kind of up in the air right now. So Bootstrap is a program um, that is provided by an out-of-state university. They've got a grant with um, the State Department of Education, and they've been working on this workshop in the Oklahoma City area for the past, I think this is their second year, and it's where um, algebra teachers can integrate um, computer science into the classroom. So it's not one more thing, it just goes seamlessly with their curriculum. And this was supposed to be the first summer where, you know, yay, we get to bring it to Tulsa. Um, the university that it's out of, and it just escapes my mind at the moment, but they, they have restricted their travel for any university personnel, so they are not able to come at this time. They are looking at converting it to virtual, um, but our state department was like, you know, why don't you go test that out on another state first and tell us how it goes before we try, you know, we don't want to be your guinea pigs for that. Um, so there, it, it, it will come eventually, but we're not quite sure yet whether it will be face-to-face -face or whether it will be um, virtual, but we will be bringing that to Tulsa as soon as we are able. And the other big workshop that we were um, planning to bring is a script workshop, and this is a strategic planning tool for districts where they identify where they are with computer science right now, um, they set goals for themselves, and then they make a plan to help them achieve those goals. This is a very like highly interactive workshop, and we didn't feel that going to a virtual setting would really do it justice. So we are working with um, Script and CS for All folks to try to reschedule it for um, January or February 2020. And there's some things up in the air with some national events that they have going on. So we're trying to find a date. It's going to happen during the next school year, but we're just not quite sure when that's going to be. And that will be open to um, We'll, have, we'll, have, we'll train facilitators from across the state so that we can um, really roll it out statewide. And then we will invite districts from the Tulsa metro area to participate. Um, next slide, please. And so if we get back to normal, we have plans to do some more code.org PD. They, um, last summer, we were able to offer, offer a fundam fundamentals class, which is for elementary. And I'd like to offer that one again. And then they also have a deep dive. So if you've been to the fundamentals, then you can go to deep dive. So being able to serve um, both people who are completely new to it and also have some experience with it. Um, we'd also like to bring back um, Dorinda Reisenhoover from the NASA Oklahoma Space Grant Consortium is an awesome um, per PD provider. She's been great during this um, pandemic in helping partner with us with camps and videos and professional development. She came last year and did a workshop that was tailored specifically for um, um, fourth grade or like fourth, fifth, and sixth grade um, social studies teachers. So really showing them like even though you don't teach a traditional STEM subject, here's the way that you can incorporate STEM into your um, curriculum. So I would love to bring her back once we're able to have um, some face-to-face -face sessions. Um, and then still for sensational science, I'm really sad that 
teachers aren't able to get out to the partner site the way they traditionally would. So we're hoping that um, for the fall and spring follow-up days that we normally have for SENT, that we can have some partner sessions where they actually get to come out to the sites and make that face-to-face -face connection. And finally, we are planning with the Computer Science Teachers Association, we are working to eventually plan a statewide computer science educators conference. Currently, there is not one in Oklahoma. There's a, there's a math conference, there's a science conference, but there's not one for CS teachers. So we really want to pave the way and let them know that, you know, they're just as important as other teachers and give them that opportunity for um, collaboration and enrichment. So those are plans once things get back to normal. If they don't get back to normal, then we'll be revisiting and figuring out how we can still accomplish this, but just in a virtual setting. And so I think moving forward, I feel like every PD session that we offer from now till maybe forever will um, probably have a plan A and a plan B as we're, as we're going through the planning process so that we're not, you know, sprung three weeks before PD is supposed to start or four weeks before PD is supposed to start like, oh, by the way, you've been planning this all year but now you need to change it up. So if we had a plan, like even if it's a tentative plan at the beginning, I think that would make it a lot easier. Um, so that kind of leads me into my next slide, which is um, uh, lessons learned for, through this process. Um, so, in addition to, you know, being cognizant of the fact that we, there could be a second outbreak, even if we get back to normal, that planning as we go from now on to have a plan B is really important. Um, I've learned that like clear and frequent communications with both partners and participants is very much appreciated. I feel like sometimes I might give them too much information, but I, I want them to know, I don't want to have radio silence and then think like, what is going on? I want them to know like, this is the plan for now. It might have to change. We're being flexible, but we're working to still um, make this happen for you. And being a resource and just being there for the partners as they're providing a service for us and if they're having struggles to let them know like, hey, we're here for you and how can we help make this easier for you. That leads into my next point is that I've learned that, surprise, surprise, there will be tech issues, um, especially we've had issues with um, loading videos and sharing videos, um, you know, internet or storage capacity, things like that. So moving forward, I would love to think of a new way where we can make this um, less of a pain point for our partners. And I've learned that it's going to take longer than you think. At the beginning, I was like, it'll be fine, it'll be great. And it is fine and it is great, but also it took, it's been taking a lot more time than I originally anticipated. I think that's partly because, like I said, it was like a spur of the moment we had to change it on the fly. Going forward, knowing that that might be a possibility and planning for that option will be much better. And making sure that there's flexibility and compassion for everybody involved, giving yourself some flexibility and compassion and saying, you know, it's going to be okay. Like, it, we will figure this out and it's going to be okay. So, um, again, most teachers are super appreciative of the new format and the fact that we can move forward and still provide them with enriching opportunities just in a different way. So I'm really excited that we're able to do that. A lot of the videos and the curriculum that we're curating um, will be made available to people outside of the workshop too. So once it's over, we will share it out publicly, what we're able to share, so even more teachers can in, um, become involved in it. And we've actually already had teachers asking about that. They know since it's virtual this year and they've been asking on social media, hey, are we gonna be able to see this too? So. The need is there, and I'm really glad and excited that we're able to help with that. And if you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you, Kristen. So next up we have Jackie talking about Osage County. Okay, good morning. Um, I, I'm the director of the Osage County Interlocal. We're based in Hominy. Um, I am recognized by the State Department of Education to do business as any other public school um, district in Oklahoma can do. So my, the difference, there's a couple of differences. One of the differences is um, I don't have students enrolled. Even though in our member districts, we serve special ed population, Native American population, uh, we help with uh, professional development. Uh, in this case, we do STEM programs in the rural schools um 
I also don't get any formula funding like other public schools. So we're totally dependent on writing federal grants. And uh, one of the grants that we wrote that we're actually in a no cost extension, it was a five year grant was for our Native American population. And it uh, provided some STEM learning. So um, I'm an English teacher uh, back in the day, way back in the day. And so it was a, a new learning for me. And when I saw Tulsa Regional STEM Alliance opportunity to jump on board, I did so way back when. Um, I'm on the governing board committee uh, for the purpose of serving, uh, trying to, to continue to reach out to the, to the rural schools. And um, Ixan and Emily have both come out to my area many times to do professional development with our area teachers. Um, so having said that, next slide shows you the member districts that we're talking about. So when we talk about no connectivity, so the next, okay, there we go. So um, when we talk about no connectivity, um, one of my schools that you'll see Bowering on the left, if you don't know where that is, it's up close to the Kansas border. It's a little pre-K-8 school. Um, kids ride the bus 30 to 45 minutes off the ranch lands to get to that school. And there's only one uh, cell phone service provider. I don't have it, but the superintendent has it, but she still hangs her, um, her phone in the window to get any kind of service at all. They do have broadband to the school, but most of the, the surrounding community homes uh, have no type of connectivity. Um, a lot of, about half of these schools that's listed there, the superintendent is also the principal. Uh, sometimes the bus driver and sometimes a coach and sometimes the janitor uh, mowing the grass in the summertime. Um, so a STEM kind of program in these schools is not feasible. So without our um, services to those districts, they would not be receiving anything uh, in the way of STEM opportunities. So the next slide, um, like many of you all, we kind of got caught with our pants down come spring break. Um, this typically we have a team of three or four educators that have taken STEM uh, lesson plans and aligned them to state standards per grade level. And they, they go out each day to some school and uh, present these STEM activities in the school. So uh, we had a lot of supplies on hand. We have a partnership with Home Depot or Office Depot that I immediately contacted. Uh, we knew that many of these kids got home without uh, any of their school supplies. So they didn't, we didn't know at the time when they would receive any school supplies. Uh, usually by spring break, the school supplies are not very, uh, very good to be able to do projects. So I brought in a couple of what I deemed essential teachers and we got together and started putting uh, STEM kits together. Um, we, um, we contacted uh, parents through our Native American parent organization, tutors, interventionists. Uh, we had them register. We, we located pickup places. We partnered with Child Nutrition. We knew that a lot of those families would come somewhere to get uh, lunches and breakfasts. So we sent STEM kits through that area. <clears throat> and we, of course, used uh, TRSA to bring their homemade STEM kits in. And we added those to our sacks of uh, supplies with lessons in them. Uh, next slide. So like the surveys mentioned early on, we tried to put something in there that we could get some feedback. Uh, we offered some um, um, gift cards for students that shared their pictures, uh, their product results through our Twitter, through our Facebook page, um, through email. We did not get the results that we wanted to, although when I talked to parents on parent committees um, through Title VI, that's our Indian Ed program, they would 
often mention, um, you know, they thanked us for sending out the STEM kits and the off the school supplies and, um, but we were kind of disappointed really with, um, we thought that was the best thing that, you know, we could do is to try to get feedback to see, we probably sent out 800 so far of STEM kits and we have still more that were, uh, we just got an okay this last week from the State Department of Education that we can do our RSA third grade reading programs uh, on the school grounds. So we will be sending out some more STEM kits uh, that way. Uh, next slide. So here are a couple of pictures that came in um, on the um, the websites, the Facebook pages, social media sites. I just wanted to share if you want to, I, did you say that video will start? Yeah, it's going to start. So doesn't have words. It just gives, it gave us an example of uh, a, a STEM activity that this little boy did. We put it in slow motion so that you could see. Maybe we can't see. <laughs> Are we waiting on Emily to load or are we going on? Oh, did it not play on your end? It played. It may have just be it may just be a delay. Okay. Okay. I didn't did any did it, other people see it? I don't know. I didn't see it. It didn't play on my end, but we'll be sharing these slides out with everyone so they okay. can watch it. Okay. So you can just go to the next slide, Emily. While she's bringing that slide up, I'll just go ahead and talk about the next slide. So um, we know that school may not look like what um, we want it to look like come fall. So we're, we're, we're starting in preparation for some kind of a blended STEM learning um, program. Uh, we are in, like I said, a no cost extension. So, uh, and I use retired teachers for this program. So it's kind of hard to get them back in. And um, again, they're all kind of my age. And so Zoom and some of those uh, distance learning type programs are not real familiar for us to use. So we're struggling there. We're kind of learning from other things. Uh, um, are you still, I, we're, I'm still not seeing anything. Are you, Emily, can you see? I'm not seeing anything. Now I'm seeing you. I think there's a huge delay. I'm going to go ahead and share again. And sorry, my dog is like growling at the garbage truck in the back now. <laughs> okay, so again, the just the, the lack of connectivity, um, the, um, the, the issues with not having connectivity with the students. I mean, yes, um, especially areas that are concerned with devices, they're concerned with Wi-Fi hotspots. Well, I'm not even sure that, that that's gonna help us. So we'll continue doing a lot of hands-on type programming where we would send STEM packets out to these students. We have about 4,000 students in those member districts. So um, our 600 seem like a lot on our end, uh, as unprepared as we were but we still have a lot more that we can do and, and are gonna to plan to do as the summer rolls around. So my big takeaway is I've listed flexibility as a must. <laughs> we just learned that right now. So it seems like about every time we, we try to do, um, we are getting ready to do professional development with about 400 teachers um, in another grant that I have and so this kind of concerns us just like what happened today is the delay the um but we're 
I, you know, as the director, I'm just going with the, don't be afraid to try it. We're going to try it. And if it works, fine. If it's not, we'll, we'll know how to adjust for the next time we hope. Uh, the thing that we have found out through all of this is the kids adapt. They, they're so much better at it than we are. And, uh, um, that's, that's kind of my program there. And I appreciate all the TRSA staff and the partnerships. Several of you that have spoke today have, have reached out to our little member districts and it's been uh, uh, very valuable and we appreciate it. Wonderful, thank you, Jackie. So I must be experiencing some Wi-Fi connectivity issues. So um, Jamie is next talking about Summer Academy. Um, and Jamie, if you happen to have the Google Slides up, would you mind sharing through your screen? And I'm going to give you host privileges, and then I'm going to just disconnect and reconnect back to Zoom. Can everyone hear me and see my screen? Hopefully, I'm seeing some head nods, which is great. We're going to see if we can adapt and, and figure this out, pull up my notes here. So thank you all uh, so much for joining us and hearing everyone else talk about what they're doing for um, their programs going forward is going to sound very similar to what we're doing. Um, I was asked today to kind of talk a little bit about our summer camps and our lessons learned. Um, but our first camp is next week, so I don't have any lessons yet. Um, in fact, uh, really what I'm going to talk to you guys today about is our plan of action. So more like what we're doing and how we got here. Um, so this is what I'm going to talk a little bit about today is uh, what do our virtual camps look like? What is our framework? What were our considerations? What resources we're using? And then um, if I have time, what camps we are actually offering today? Um, this is my super quick disclaimer that this is just our um, idea, our best laid plan. Um, we certainly know it's not perfect, um, but we think it's a, a good enough model that we can share it out with others and then certainly ask for collaboration and input if you guys have any. Um, I'd like to start out with this quote from Saturday Night Live, if any of you um, are familiar or fans. Um, this is a great one. Uh, Lauren Michaels is a producer and he says, you know, the show doesn't go on because it's ready. It goes on because it's 1130. Um, and I think that's so true now. Ideally, we would have started planning this a long time ago, uh, but it's summertime, so it's time to go live. Um, so we're, we're doing the best we can. I'm just going to touch briefly on our considerations um, as we began working on what a virtual summer camp would look like. Our two biggest ones were safety and equity. Um, so if the students aren't safe, none of this matters. Uh, the work we're doing isn't important unless these students are safe. So um, obviously, first and foremost, we moved our camps to a virtual setting um, in the midst of a pandemic. That's important. Um, but also going online is another big consideration, right? We know there are bad things and people on the internet and an untold number of things that could go wrong, even unintentionally. Um, so how do we make sure that the students are protected to the best of our ability at all times? Um, we know that there are a couple of issues with our format and um, our thing, those are things that we're working on and I can touch on a little bit more, but um, how can we continue to have those peer to peer relationships and peer to mentor relationships that are super critical um, in our STEM camps. Uh, we're going to talk um, a little bit more about materials later, but how can we provide materials or um, get materials in these students' hands and ensure that they feel supported and have proper instruction so that they're safe um, performing these activities. And then equity. I don't think I need to tell anyone on this uh, webinar or conference call today uh, that access to internet and computer um, is difficult for you know, many people in our area, but all across the country. Um, so how can we make sure that students access the things that they need to to engage in STEM? And then uh, materials. Um, access to materials is also a, a really big issue. So I'll talk about kind of our considerations there in a little bit. Um, when we started this, we really um, thought a lot about how our participants can participate in this camp and what levels of participation we can expect. And really, uh, we came up with two types. We've got our STEM campers. Um, these are students who would have participated and attended in person if we were able to have that. Um, 
So they will receive um, what's considered a STEM camp toolkit, which is an awesome box that they'll get in the mail that has um, some lessons, some concepts to share with them, but then all of the instructions needed in order to engage in hands-on, minds-on, meaningful STEM activities, um, unplugged. Um, if they have access to a device and the internet, we've got a whole online learning environment um, where they can engage in a number of things, including pre-recorded videos, um, as well as online resources. So ways to expand their learning, like escape rooms, presentations, uh, practice skills, that sort of thing, all in an online environment. But then we also realized uh, that um, there are a number of kids who could participate because we're no longer limited by the size of the classroom or the number of lunches that we can pay for. Um, so if they have access to the internet, um, they can participate too. Um, so what they'll be getting or what they have access to is all of the instructions and materials lists for these uh, unplugged activities as well as those same online resources, um, the videos, the games, presentations, etc. cetera. Um, more kids experiencing STEM is a great thing. So we were really excited about that. But again, that materials um, list there is, is a little bit of an issue. And so we're thinking through how can we how can we bring this to the most to as many students as possible. So then we realized we actually have four levels of participation. You have those campers who receive the toolkits, but some of them will have access to the internet and some of them will not. And then you have those club members who thankfully have access to the internet. Um, some are able to purchase supplies to help them through the experience and then you have some who are unable to. Um, so how can we reach all four levels of participants here? So here's this beloved uh, materials consideration slide. Um, I pulled a little bit of this from our friends at the Pear Institute and um, through Dimensions of Success. You might have heard Josh talk about that a little bit earlier. Um, but our considerations for materials are, are they appropriate? Do they support our learning objective? Are they age appropriate? Uh, are they safe? We're assuming that they may have little to no adult supervision or support. Are they appealing? Uh, will this entice the students to participate? And are they easily sourced? In the midst of a pandemic, uh, access to necessary materials um, is, is a little bit challenging and shipping times have been extended. Um, and then, uh, are these materials accessible to uh, our families and those who are at the club level and have to source their own materials? Um, so you can see some um, examples here of what we might consider easily sourced materials, paper, maybe toothpicks, tape, pencils. Um, again, we certainly know that a number of these things are a challenge to students, um, but we really looked in our own kitchens and around our homes and thought, what are the materials that you know, we see that we could have and made some assumptions about maybe what other families can have and where possible are um, allowing for substitutions. So our um, activities as a part of our camp are kind of broken out into two buckets. We have our STEM challenges. Um, these are pretty specific materials um, that will likely need to be purchased. I have a couple examples here, like a weather science kit for our STEM investigation camp. Um, it's 10 bucks on Amazon. Um, and we also have a stethoscope. Uh, in a normal environment, I, I'll ask you, raise your hand if you have a stethoscope at home. Um, but I'll go ahead and assume that it's not a common household item. But um, an important step in our MASH camp for students to learn um, all about the human body. Um, so those are things that we will provide to our campers. Um, and or provide links so that families at home could purchase them if they're able. But then we've got a number of challenges to build off of on top of that, which are kind of our, our STEM at home challenges. Um, so again, easily sourced from hopefully around the house um, and the grocery store. And for those who are familiar, um, similar to our STEM in a bag, which Josh mentioned a little bit earlier. Um, so here's an example of a hoop glider, I think Probably many of you are familiar with it. Um, the stick that he's holding could be a straw, a skewer, a pencil. Um, the hoops could be made out of paper, index cards, uh, toilet paper, paper towel tubes, like you can see here, or you know those flyers and papers that are sent home in students' folders that always get lost. Those are the sorts of things you can look around, you can find them, and you can build a hands-on meaningful uh, STEM um, activity for these students. 
And it's actually a really great way for them to practice that engineer design process. So then we're moving on to online resources. The great thing is we're no longer restricted by geography. I'm not bringing students to our partners. I'm bringing our partners to our students, um, which just means more possibilities. Um, it's self-paced, which is great. It's designed, you know, that the students can engage in STEM and these activities for a couple hours a day for five days. Um, but we know that some students are um, super ambitious, so they might try to do it all in one or two days. And then um, for those students who are, um, have limited time, they could do an activity a week for all summer. Um, so it's, it's great for them. Um, it also allows students to engage in things that interest them or um, in, in, in a way that allows for their learning style. Um, so we could do step-by-step -step written instructions for a challenge, but we can also provide a video for them. So whatever their, their learning style is there. Um, we want to be able to provide access to our STEM professional videos um, so students can meet people who are just like them, who maybe grew up in the same town, went to the same school, um, people who look like them. Um, we really want to break down STEM professional stereotypes because um, all of these students can be a STEM professional if that's what they want to do. Um, demonstrations, uh, these students can now see experiences that may, that maybe unsafe for them to see in person. So that's exciting. And then we could do virtual tours. Uh, they can see the Tulsa Zoo, but then we could do a virtual tour of the San Diego Zoo and um, they can compare those two things. Um, we also are um, providing uh, links to online games and escape rooms, ways for them to expand their learning um, if they're interested and wanna continue that. So um, I wanna talk just a little bit about our partner collaborations. Um, these programs are certainly not possible without um, our community of Alliance members. I think literally every partner on this call has contributed to our programs already in some way, and we are just uh, so thankful. Um, but for our in-person, um, or I'm sorry, for our online camps, we want them to be similar to our in-person camps and provide that authentic experience. Um, so we've got these STEM professional um, videos where um, they can, of course, meet professionals. It helps um, make up for that lack of mentorship that they would experience in person. Um, we've requested from our partners different activities and challenges, similar to when I bring students to that partner, they would maybe do a couple activities that would let those students um, have experience in that STEM profession or learn more about that area of STEM. And then any sort of enriching content. I think this is um, a particularly um, a, a big point for like our higher ed partners who are used to teaching and showing students. Um, so they've got a lot of enriching content that they might be interested in sharing with us that we could help share out with um, younger students to get them on that pathway and that pipeline um, to a STEM career. Um, this, I'm not going to play this for you, um, but when we share out the slides, you can certainly take a look at it later. This is just an example of a STEM professional video. Um, what you can see here is it's not fancy. In fact, uh, this is Kristen Martin. She's a pediatrician. Um, she does a really great job just trying to relate to the students. She shares her work, her career path, the pros and cons of her job. And um, she's giving a thumbs up in this thumbnail here. And really what she's sharing is that um, she doesn't like to give kids shots and as a pediatrician, that's not her job. It's the nurse's job. So she's really proud of that and she shares that with the students. So if that's something that they don't like, they could be a pediatrician. So it's just a super great way for, to expose students um, to, to more STEM professionals. Um, when we first began this adventure and discovering what could it possibly look like to have a summer camp in a virtual format, we talked to a lot of really smart people. I'm going to give a shout out to Stan Kropot, who gave us a really great piece of advice that said, use what you already know. Make it easy, be familiar, don't reinvent the wheel. Um, for TRSA, we are a G Suite family, so um, what's easy for us is to use everything Google, and it's worked, so, it's worked well so far. Um, so uh, all of our camps have their own Google site. Um, we're using Google Docs to um, collaborate and put curriculum together, especially in this virtual environment. That's really helpful. Um, we 
aren't reinventing the wheel in terms of activities. Um, what we're doing is finding what's already available through amazing resources like code.org or try engineering, um, maybe reformatting them a little because they're written for classroom activities. Um, um, so reformatting that to give the instructions to students and then providing them with the, those exact same worksheets that we normally would in an in in-person environment. Utilizing YouTube for our videos so it doesn't slow down our website. Um, using Google Forms, we've got um, forms embedded into the website. So should students have questions, um, they can ask us and let us know the best way to get them the answer. So they don't have to wait until mom's available um, or they have access to a phone to call us. They can submit uh, a request and then we can get back to them in the way that works the best for them. And then uh, similar, to sur similar with surveys. Uh, we want to make sure that we're collecting um, data and feedback from our student participants so we're using google forms for that and then if you're just really curious about what the inner workings of jamie's mind looks like and how i plan these things here's an example of a budget spreadsheet that i created for our camp so we could track um, wh what expenses we have going into each toolkit um, for the students so when we share out um, these slides, you can certainly click through these examples and they're all three um, for the same camp. So you just get a good perspective on, on that. It's our summer engineering camp. So take a look and let me know what questions you have. Um, for the sake of time, I um, am just gonna kind of skip through um, or skip over our different camp offerings. You guys are welcome to go to our um, Summer Academy page, which is tulsystem.org slash summer hyphen academy um, and that's going to list out all of the 11 different summer camp options that we have um, and many of which are being provided by partners like global gardens and the tulsa zoo um, so definitely check those out i do want to just say for those who are curious how can students participate in our camps well um, those students who are at the camper level and will receive that toolkit have already been selected um, based on the applications we received um, at the end of March, um, but we do want to encourage any students who are interested to go ahead and fill out the waitlist application. This is my quick point in that all of our programs are offered at no cost, so we hope that that's not an issue for anyone. Um, but then if those students fill out the waitlist application, there's a good chance that a couple of campers will drop out and we want to make sure that those kits get in the hands of students who are interested in engaging with them. So we'll pull kids from the waitlist and send those kits out if we have any extras. In addition to that, we'll send them an email and let them know when a camp goes live and they can engage with it um, at the club level and source their own materials as they need to. Um, we're working with a number of really great community partners, um, similar to Courtney mentioned earlier, uh, Tulsa Public Schools, um, working through and helping provide some virtual camp opportunities. Um, same thing with the Opportunity Project. They have a text-based um, program where students can receive uh, activities via text um, we're doing STEM in a Bags, which I know you've heard a lot about today already, and then working with a couple of partners, um, the AIA of Eastern Oklahoma and Union Public Schools to provide um, some resources to help with Camp T-Square later this summer as well. Um, I just want to say, if you have ideas or suggestions about anything I've said today, I, we really want to hear it, or if you need help um, or a thought partner, we, we will certainly be there to provide that for you. Um, I do want to add that we are so excited about the opportunity to bring these programs to even more students and we know it's not perfect. Um, in fact, uh, it's been quite an experience figuring it all out, but as Mr. Krabs would say, uh, what doesn't kill you usually succeeds in a second attempt. No, wait, that's actually not what I meant at all. I meant to say what we're doing is the best that we can until we know better and then we're going to do better. So um we're we're going live and we're making these summer camps available to students and where possible we want to make it a better experience for them and in fact we might fail but we know that's the first attempt in learning or at least that's what we try to encourage our students to believe um, so check back next week or a couple weeks um, and i'd be glad to share any more lessons learned or actual lessons learned with you all does anyone have any questions? And of course, here's my email address if you um, would like to reach out to me. Great, I'm gonna kick it back over to Emily. Is she here? Thank you, Jamie. Yeah, we'll see if this is gonna work online right now. Okay. 
Wonderful. So maybe. And then All right, can you guys see it? Not yet. Uh-oh. <laughs> it should be sharing, should be on Brian's. Anything? Jamie, can you rescue us again? Yeah, absolutely, I'd be so glad to share. Um, can you share the presentation with me? I only have my slides. Yes. All right, um, while we are getting this ready to go up, Brian, would you like to go ahead and start and do your intro and then we will get the slides up as soon as we can. Yep, that sounds good. Can everyone hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I'm sure people are gonna write papers on the uh, psychology and the phases of uh, educators and non-traditional educators and particularly students going through a uh, pandemic, but uh, for the first several weeks, everyone said, what are you gonna do? And it's kind of like, well, we're gonna kind of do what we tell our students they need to do in life. So uh, we had to figure out how to uh, be very agile with uh, changing our plans. Luckily we had spring break to try to figure out how to put together a strategy, adapt and then uh, build collaborations. Outdoor classroom and like a lot of people, we're in the service industry. So if we don't have our young customers, we don't, have our need for wait staff. So we pared it down to uh, just myself. And I was very grateful to uh, some lifelines and uh, connections thrown out by our funders. Before the government came up with a PPP, we had a funder that said, we're gonna help your hourly workers to get to their next uh, rent check. So there's a whole lot of, uh, and this would be a key point of the uh, presentation, We've sown a lot of seeds, uh, particularly over the last five years for outdoor classroom. And I'm just totally blown away by what has uh, sprouted, bloomed, grow, and now are bearing uh, incredible fruit. Uh, I will say this up front. It's very counterintuitive to run an outdoor classroom online. I spend my entire time telling kids to get away from their computers. And now it's kind of like, could you go sit in front of a computer and do outdoor classroom? So that's that's been sort of a uh, challenge. Uh, we have found out real quickly that we have uh, new sources of input for how our program will run. And then we have just, it's amazing the outputs in our target audiences. And I appreciate my presentation being up there. This is one of my favorite uh, photos of the giant wave, the tsunami in uh, Japan. A lot of people can look at this very differently. I love the uh, energy and the fact that the boat in the foreground, which is hard to see, it isn't wrecked, but they've got some very significant uh, challenges there. So there's a lot of physics in this photo that uh, kind of is the way we have felt over the last, uh, since right before spring break. And if I can go back to just one of my, uh, my second bullet point, uh, one thing I have had to do and constantly think about is, you know, if I, they always say you want to walk a mile in another person's shoes. And so I'm thinking of your Jamie's, your Emily's, uh, your Kristen's and everyone who I work with on the other side. Well, with this pandemic, we all had to buy a new pair of shoes. So I'm greatly appreciative. And I know you all are doing uh, tremendous new things that, are just not unique to our situation. So if we can go to the next slide. Okay, so I have a beautiful logic model and it tells me the, uh, the reality of our uh, situation and the customers we're trying to serve. It tells us our programs and how we're going to accomplish and measure our outcomes. And I kind of tie back to uh, Josh's comment. Well, one of the key components was that we'd have a lot of kids running around 44 acre uh, learning campus in Woodward Park, not really going virtual. So I had to, and then 
we have a key part of our program is an SEL test because we pull mostly from uh, schools that have STEM inequities, and I feel for the uh, Osage uh, County uh, schools on that, particularly if you can't connect virtually. But a lot of times the school is a sanctuary for those kids, and in an outdoor classroom, it's just a uh, wonderful experience that they just may never see. So we miss our kids, and we had to figure out how to kind of change up our program in order to provide teachers some tools, and also understand that teachers are now not just your classroom teachers, they're parents, they're guardians, they're mentors. We started to evolve our uh, video programs so that anyone can watch them and learn from them. We also, all of our teacher PD, it's kind of like, wow, why don't we make it so you can also show it to your students? Kind of let them see how the sausage is made for uh, putting together a lesson plan. So it is very tough to go from a dialogue to a uh, monologue because I, if people ask, you know, what do you miss about it? It's kind of like, I miss about 15 snarky fifth graders asking me the most amazing questions in finding something at Woodward Park that I hadn't seen before. I miss that. The Blue Ocean Strategy uh, is a business, it's a business uh, terminology that says we had to increase our pool not just fifth graders. My very first request over spring break was from Broken Arrow Elementary School that says our kids always get to see, uh, we order chicks, they get to watch them hatch and we plant seeds and watch them uh, grow. Those were our first couple of videos. We we're happy to do that. Uh, program costs, which I'm sure if I looked at uh, Jamie's uh, summer camp program spreadsheet, we had to go from soil to uh, technology. And that's been uh, quite a challenge and a lot of Amazon orders and quite a few returns. Here's the, probably the key thing that we uh, have taken away from this, uh, this period is I'm studying my clock over here to make sure it's cutting down. I don't want to catch up. Uh, you know, we all have been doing this for uh, years. We've taken a lot of professional development over the years. We've taken uh, dimensions of success classes. We've gone to, uh, you know, next generation science standards and all of that. Well, we have all that information, that experience and knowledge. And we, but a lot of the people who are thr thrusted into this new uh, learning environment, uh, and I'm thinking of parents, I'm thinking of grandparents, of uh, guardians and, uh, teachers having to go virtual, you had to really kind of tighten up your game. So the second half of my presentation will be a great video where we uh, worked with a, a young mechanical engineering graduate from the University of Tulsa to kind of help both teachers and the kids understand the engineering design process. And we introduce the uh, Pair Institute's dimensions of success. That way you can people at home remotely distance learning can really think there's a method to the madness of creating a highly effective STEM activity. My second to the last one there is rabbit holes. When you, uh, one thing I love about outdoor classroom is every morning when you wake up, nature has changed your classroom. So we actually depended on that with the exception of uh, squirrel spotting at Woodward Park because we have too many. We depend on kids to look around and make observations. So that's been the most challenging part um, over the last uh, eight weeks is in our videos, it's kind of like, ah, oh, could you all pause and head down this rabbit hole, go down this one. We're trying to build connectors. So I've, that makes the video editing a lot harder because you're saying, why don't you go to dive deep here? Why don't you go explore that? But it's videos, 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 Zoom. Can you go to the next slide, please? Okay. The, this is just a sampling of our video library. What I did is uh, I love watching TED Talks. So we tried to create that little uh, pop intro and then uh, dive into the video. But visit our YouTube channel at uh, Outdoor Classroom at Woodward Park and you can catch any of these. And if you can go to the uh, next one, please. Okay, I wanna close and I know we, I've run out of time here, but uh, we wanted to uh, adapt our program to inspire teachers, mentors, students, parents, and then really ourselves. Uh, 
we don't have any DOS observers sitting over my computer uh, saying, do you know how to video edit? So we wanted to provide some tools to engage uh, people so that they know really at the end of this whole process, they're going to greatly admire their children's teachers because that's a special gift. It's a special education, a special skill. Not every parent uh, was, has it in them to be a great teacher. So we wanted to give them some uh, uh, tools that they could watch with their kids and go, oh, I guess you're supposed to know that. <laughs> and uh, once again, I appreciate the uh, engagement with our funders, our collaborative partners. It gets back to uh, have we built a, a strong foundation over the last five years and in the last eight weeks, we have found out that people have come to the uh, surface to help make this a uh, hopefully successful for our end users or young customers. We're only gonna play uh, five minutes and 29 seconds. This is a great video created by a mechanical engineer. I'll let you start it and then you can find them all at the uh, YouTube channel, but this is what every teacher and student should watch and have fun with. Thanks. Can you see or hear it? Yep. No. We may need to just do as we have with some of the other videos and let people look at it later, Brian. Okay, we it's a great one. So thank you all very much if you have any questions. This is great, underlined five times. You should all watch this, it's super great. Well, this is a new one, Axan, that brings in uh, the dimensions of success. Thank you all. Brian, so you said it was YouTube Outdoor Classroom Woodward Park, is that the title? Yeah, if you, if you do your Google search and you go YouTube and then you go Outdoor Classroom Woodward Park, it'll take you to our uh, channel. Okay. And if you got younger students, uh, the ducklings to uh, ducks has been very popular. We do seeds to plants. And um, I work with a lot of Cheryl Cheadle on soil erosion models. But uh, the, there's two videos on the design process, a two-part one for composting that the, was the senior design project uh, for mechanical engineers at TU. They knock it out of the ballpark and then they have a great bonus feature of seven steps of brainstorming, which is really teamwork. And God, if you just show it to your class and go, this is how we want you to behave. <laughs> these are the seven things you need to do. And I also think these videos will help uh, teachers with science fair projects in the fall. If the kids watch these, they'll go, hmm, that's what you're expecting from us. That's great. Yeah, I'm just going to do a plug for Brian and don't forget to subscribe to the channel so you can see. Oh, thank, you. thank you, Jamie. <laughs> you're, welcome. you're welcome. I'm going to kick it on over to Emily and Aaliyah. Thank you. Uh, so we're going to just kind of go through a couple of things that we have learned um, doing a little bit more um, virtual learning. Pretty much everything we're doing at TRSA is virtual learning at this point, um, but we've kind of added a couple of new programs in with it. So if you don't mind going next slide. This is a little bit about our process. So you can notice, and I think you guys can all relate, there are about two weeks in March where things had to roll pretty quick. And then we kind of had to just accept the position in April that we were building the plane while flying it. Um, I have a plane flying behind me, so you might hear it, it's pretty appropriate. And I think that's still going on. We are still building the plane while flying it. I think right now we're getting a little bit uh, better about understanding, you know, the the different components that need to go into making this work, such as having a village to make this work. Um, but then also being able to move forward and understanding that, you know, this, this isn't something that's just gonna end. Um, you know, this virtual landscape is something that can be a value add to all of our programs. So we are trying to approach this with grace and flexibility, but also with very high expectations thinking this is a new way to add a whole nother dimension to our programming. So we'll go to the next slide and Aliyah is gonna take it. Yeah, so Jamie, if you can just go one more forward and another one. 
<laughs> All right, perfect. Um, so stay organized is the first thing. Just like any programming, you'll need to keep track of a lot of logistics. Um, I think in addition to that, just communicating as a team and with partners, um, there's a lot to keep track of. And this is gonna kind of tie into what Emily's saying next, but there would be points where I like to schedule out social media posts for a few days in advance and things would change with what we're marketing within those two days of when I scheduled it. So just making sure that you have a place to come to, to make sure you have the most up-to-date information to share and just to keep track of anything. All right, and you can go forward. Like one more. So one thing we did not anticipate, and this was actually a serendipitous moment, where when we plan on having summer academies um, face to face, uh, we were doing this planning for um, a training for all the camp counselors and anybody who's providing programming. And Jamie spent a whole lot of time, you know, thinking about how that's going to work and all the logistics. So then as soon as we had to go virtual, we had to put all that virtual. And then we realized that there is this overwhelming desire of this, not to just be for people that were going to be involved in our summer academies, but anybody experiencing virtual learning. And I think it's also a testament that people are also looking for something that is homegrown. Um, there's a lot of different webinars, as you guys are aware of many, many experts putting out wonderful grant advice. But I think there's also a demand for people who are out of the community in which these educators are teaching in um, to really be able to understand, you know, what's happening in Tulsa and the Oklahoma region. So this Elevate and Educate really has morphed into professional development series that we are going to continue through Thursdays. Um, and, and it's about being able to change on a dime. So it's about being able to be flexible to understanding like this is what we originally had planned and it's wonderful and it's fantastic. But now, you know, there's this new need. And so how can we fit this into the new need and grow and continue to let it develop? Um, so that's really what it's been about. We'll go to the next. All right, equity can never be assumed or implied, make it an explicit goal. Um, I love how Jamie talked about this earlier when she was going over the camps. Some things that we've done is really try to get those free kits out to people, understanding that we can offer things on the virtual front, but if they don't have access to the materials to do it, then it's not gonna be as strong. So really pairing that and making sure that the things we put out come from many different angles um, and really reach the students where they're at in the needs that they have. Um, and so this is gonna be a major recurring theme in this, but thanking partners um, who helped us to get those bags out to people who helped create those, um, put them together, who created those videos, um, just to make sure that what we were doing was equitable and is equitable. So Kristen mentioned this very much, and I think everybody who has been working in this digital landscape can understand that it's a lot more work um, than we ever anticipated, even at some points, even more work than face-to-face -face programming. Um, there are certain assumptions that could be made with face-to-face -face programming to where you can change things on a dime if you're face-to-face. -face. If the students aren't really going or your educators aren't really going in the direction you thought they would go, you can, you can pivot. That's a lot harder to do, so you have to be able to anticipate what some of those pivot points could be in a digital landscape and be able to provide those resources for it. Um, so all the program we've done has really been a testament to that. Um, but it's also about the design process in general. And I think, you know, we are a STEM organization and what better way to really demonstrate the design process than to be enacting it in front of the world right now. Um, so we really have been brainstorming, designing, testing, redesigning, sharing solutions constantly. And it's, it's actually helped us grow a lot personally and professionally, and we are thankful for that opportunity. Um, but then it's also something to where we want to showcase to educators and to anyone we work with that it, it's a part of it and it's something to accept and to, to appreciate to a point and just to know that it is going to be a lot of work. Um, even the STEM challenges that are just seem so very small, so very easy. When you're in your own backyard trying to film a STEM challenge and you have dogs running around and planes over your head, it, it's, it's a little bit more than, 
than you originally thought it could be, but the benefit and the outcome is so amazing. And then having the incredible partners that we have to be a part of this with us and be on this journey with us is wonderful. We'll go to the next. And then, yeah. So as we've said, throughout this entire thing, partners, 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 we would not have been able to do any of this without the incredible members of the STEM Alliance um, and, and everyone. Um, so it does take a village. We're grateful for all the people on this slide who have really done it. There are so many people who aren't on this slide who have also made this possible. Um, whether it's through STEM in a bag, through camps, through STEM challenge videos. So we're just completely grateful to them. Um, we know that we're in a very nice place where we can ask a ton of partners. Um, so no matter where you are in the TRSA community, just knowing that you can reach out to all of us and we can work together on that um, can help move that forward. one more so i think this this quote actually comes from when we were developing um uh, Tulsa public schools contacted us and asked us if we'd be willing to help um schedule in partners to be a part of the roger state university uh broadcast so they do a broadcast on um well it's monday through friday and they were really gracious and gave us two time slots during that week and so we could schedule in um, many many partners to do essentially a live skype session that can reach about a million viewers across green countries so a little terrifying, I know. Our partners are very, very brave and they took that challenge head on and really knocked it out of the park. But it was the producer from the RSU and we went through um, some tips and some different things to keep in mind whenever you're planning your Skype session to be aired live um, and then available on internet for all to see. Um, authenticity is better than perfection because we, we, ha we have to accept that we are in a place where we can't pretend that we everything is perfect. It obviously isn't. And so authenticity and humanity are probably the two most important things that we can portray to, to everybody. So we, we strive for high quality and excellence, um, but we need to remain authentic and, and have humanity. Um, so one thing that we said is, yes, in these videos, let your office show let your kitchen show in the background let your two-year-old run through the screen your dogs are going to be barking the garbage truck is going to be picking up garbage outside your house you know these are real things that every single person is living through and so we we shouldn't try to conceal it we are all humans and that that brings that connection even closer so that we can all be you know together alone um, and so we try to bring that authenticity through all of our programming. So with all of our videos for the STEM challenge videos, for professional development, for summer camps, all of those you're going to see like, these are real people living in real homes, working in real places. You know, it's, it's not this grand far off Hollywood view, it's, it's real life. And that's perfection right there. All right, Jamie, and if you could just move forward a couple more. Perfect. Um, tying into what Emily was saying, really embracing other people's authenticity as we celebrate it. So expect high quality, but practice patience, compassion, grace, and understanding. Everybody is going through this. We're not going through it in the same way necessarily, but we are all experiencing something completely different than normal life. Um, so just really having grace and compassion with each other and understanding that things might take longer than usual, or there might be a mistake that could have been in a normal situation caught. It's gonna look different, but that's mm -hmm. part of the beauty of it. And that's part of that authenticity of where we're coming from. And Jamie, if you can move it forward one more. Okay. So it should say at the end, everyone is stressed. <laughs> <laughs> because as you can see, things don't always go the way you expect them to. And so just um, having compassion with each other there. 
So if you'd like to learn more about some of the um, stay at home challenges and different opportunities to stim and bags that we post online or any of the RSU videos, um, there's a link there that you guys will see when we send out all the slides to everybody. Um, but then also a little bit with the, the grace and understanding, we want to make sure we send everyone a virtual hug. So in closing, does anyone have any questions for any of the presenters? And we would love to thank everybody who's joined this call. We know you guys have many, many demands put upon you and appreciate every single one of you on here. All right, otherwise, um, our next meeting is my birthday, September 3rd. So we will have cake, but not for me, for all of us, for TRSA, because it is also the TRSA birthday. Um, so please join us. We are not really sure what the meeting will look like. Um, it will either be face-to-face -face or virtual. We're not quite sure. Um, but we're going to embrace what the future holds and move forward with grace and high expectations. And thank all of you for being here with us today. Please stay safe, stay healthy, and we hope to see you either virtually or face-to-face -face, um, very, very soon. Have a great day, everyone.